Today I've got a nice classic problem from linear algebra for you. So we want to start off with two n by n matrices with entries in C, the complex numbers, and we are supposing that those matrices commute. So in other words, AB equals BA. So this is in general not true when it comes to multiplication of matrices then our goal is to show that A and B share at least one eigenvector. So we'll review what it means to be an eigenvector of a matrix along the way. And then if you'd like to see more like abstract linear algebra, or as I like to call it, linear algebra, you can see this course that I'm putting together slowly on my second channel math major. And I say I'm putting it together slowly because I'm not scheduled to teach linear algebra at my college and I haven't taught it in a couple of years. So I'm kind of prioritizing the courses that I'm teaching up on that channel. Okay, so anyway, let's get to it. So let's start with an eigenvector of A. So let's suppose we have... So let's say V is in CN, so it's an n-dimensional complex vector such that it's an eigenvector of A. In other words, A times V equals lambda times V for some lambda in C. And that lambda is called the eigenvalue for that eigenvector. So that's the relationship that we have here. So let's fill that in here. So V is an eigenvector, and then lambda is the associated eigenvalue. And I guess one of the reasons we're taking the complex numbers here is because if you have a real n by n matrix, then you could envision an impossibility to have an eigenvector without spilling over into the complex numbers. Maybe a standard example of that would be two by two rotation matrices. Okay, so now let's start making the following observation using kind of our given. And notice that our only given is that AB equals BA. So let's notice that A times BV is the same thing as B times AV, which is the same thing as B times lambda V, which is the same thing as lambda BV. Great, and then if I were to fill in some parentheses here, maybe fill in parentheses around this BV, and then this BV, you see that I have another eigenvector eigenvalue relationship for my matrix A. And in fact, B times V is also an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. So let's write that down. So B times V is an eigenvector of A with eigenvalue lambda. And in fact, we can push this further, and we can push this further by making the following kind of larger observation, and that's A times B to the K power of V is the same thing as B to the K power of AV. We just apply this commutativity rule over and over and over again to slide A past all of these copies of B, but that's going to give us lambda times b to the k power of v. So in fact, we have something that's quite a bit stronger, which I'll put in this green box, and that is b to the k is an eigenvector of a with eigenvalue lambda, and this is gonna be true for all k bigger than or equal to zero. And we can actually generalize this a little bit more. And not only is b to the k times v an eigenvector, but any constant multiple of this eigenvector will also be an eigenvector. So a times b to the k times v is an eigenvector of a with eigenvalue lambda for all k bigger than or equal to zero and a not equal to zero. And we can actually generalize what's happening in this green box quite a bit, um, but we're running out of room, so let's do that. So on the last board, we started assuming that we had an eigenvector V corresponding to eigenvalue lambda of our matrix A. 
And using this commutativity rule, we expanded that to show that we indeed have a more general eigenvector, a times b to the k times v, where b was that matrix. And it has the same eigenvalue. It also has eigenvalue lambda. And now we're going to extend that even further and show that for all polynomials, I'll call them f, b evaluated at that polynomial times v is also an eigenvector of a with eigenvalue lambda. Okay, so let's check that out. So we're going to say that f of z is equal to, well, maybe I'll use the numbers c0 plus c1z plus c2z squared all the way up to cm times z to the m. So let's see. That means that f evaluated at b times v will be equal to c0 times v plus c1 times bv plus c2 times b squared v all the way up to cm times b to the m times v. Great. So we're claiming that that's also an eigenvector of a. So let's hit a into this. So let's notice that a evaluated at f of b v will be equal to c0 a v plus c1 a times b v plus all the way up to c m times a b m v. But by what we proved on the last board, we know that a v is equal to lambda v a b v is equal to lambda b v. And finally, way up here, a b to the m v is equal to lambda b to the m v. So that allows us to factor a lambda out of the whole thing. And after factoring a lambda out of the whole thing, we have exactly what's on this line just above. In other words, we have lambda times f evaluated at b times v. But that's exactly what we wanted to show with this claim. Okay, so now that we've ar we are armed with this claim, we're ready to finish it off. So far we've determined that given our setup, in other words, A and B are commuting n by n matrices, and V is an eigenvector of A with eigenvalue lambda, then for any polynomial, which we'll call F of Z and C adjoint Z, f evaluated at b times v is also an eigenvector of a with the same eigenvalue. And now armed with this construction that we've done, we're ready to finish this thing off. And we'll start by making a list of vectors maybe generated by v, our original eigenvector, and b, our other matrix. Okay, so let's do that. So let's say we'll consider the following list of vectors. We'll start with v, and then we'll have b times v, b squared times v, b cubed times v, all the way up to b to the n power times v. And now let's notice that each of these vectors is an n-dimensional complex space. So it's in an n-dimensional vector space. And the important thing here is the number of vectors that we have. And we can easily count and see that we have n plus 1 total vectors. So if we've got n plus 1 total vectors in an n-dimensional space, then that means this list of vectors is linearly dependent. That's because we've got more vectors than dimensions. But if this is a linearly dependent set of vectors, then we have a so-called linear dependence relation. So let's build that linear dependence relation. So there exists maybe A0, A1, all the way up to AN, not all zero, such that we have a0 times v plus a1 times b times v plus a2 times b squared times v all the way up to a n times b to the n times v equals the zero vector. Like I said, we've got a linear dependence relation. That's exactly what this is. Okay, so from here we'll define a corresponding polynomial. 
So we'll call that polynomial P. So let's define P of Z to be A naught plus A1 times Z plus A2 times Z squared all the way up to A sub N times Z to the N. And by this definition of this polynomial, as well as this linear dependence relation, we see that P evaluated at B multiplying onto the vector V gives us the zero vector. And why is that? Well, this is just a like, nice and efficient way to write this linear dependence relation. So that's nice. Okay, so from here what we'll do is factor this polynomial completely. And we're able to do that because we're over the complex numbers. So that's why it's important to be over the complex numbers or really any algebraically closed field. So let's do that. We're going to factor P of Z as... Let's maybe pull a number out. So we'll pull the highest term out, maybe the leading coefficient. Maybe I'll just call that a instead of a sub n. And then we'll have z minus something I'll call mu one, z minus something I'll call mu two, all the way up to z minus mu n. Okay, nice. But now, rewriting this equation, which is overlined in orange, gives us something nice. So let's write that down. We have this number a, and then we'll have b minus mu1 times the identity matrix, b minus mu2 times the identity matrix, all the way up to b minus mu n times the identity matrix multiplying on our vector v equals zero. So that's just a re-expression of this linear dependence relation in factored form. Okay, nice. But now what we're gonna do is like really ask a question. We'll ask a bunch of questions in a row. So we'll just take each of these factors one at a time and ask, is this product zero yet? So we'll start right here. So we'll start with b minus mu n i on v and ask, is that zero yet? We know that we'll eventually get zero because this entire product is zero. And what we'll do is we'll cut this off at the last spot before it is zero. So that let's say that last spot is right here and that's something like B minus, maybe we'll say mu M times the identity matrix. That's the last spot where this thing is not zero. Then we'll go ahead and set our polynomial Q of Z equal to that product of everything that does not turn V into zero. So in other words, we'll have z minus mu m, z minus mu m plus 1, all the way up to, let's see, we'll have z minus mu n. Great. So notice that's a polynomial. And then what we'll see is that q of b on v is not zero. That's how we chose this mu m, but the next one is zero. Again, we chose this mu m to be the cutoff point. So that means that we have like something like b minus mu m minus one times the identity times q of b times v is zero. Again, by the fact that we chose this to be the cutoff point. Okay, so now let's take that data and we're ready to finish it off. So we just finished constructing a polynomial which we called Q, so that when we evaluate our matrix B at Q and then multiply into the matrix into the vector V, we do not get zero. But if we were to multiply that whole setup by B minus mu times the identity matrix, we do get zero. Where I'd like to point out that I've done a little bit of renaming since the last board, just to make it easier, I have renamed mu as mu m minus one, or really mu m minus one as mu, just to keep things a little bit easier. 
Okay, so now we're actually ready to finish this thing off. So let's set a new vector w equal to q of b times v. And the important thing this is that this is non-zero. So I think I glossed over that a little bit, but the precise definition of an eigenvector is that it has to be non-zero. So this is a non-zero vector. And then notice by this green star, rewriting that a little bit, we have B times W is equal to mu times W. Great. And then by our thing that we kind of started this thing off with, so in other words, by this yellow star, we have A times W is equal to lambda times W. But that's really great news because we've found exactly what we wanted to find. So W is a shared eigenvector of A and B, which was the whole thing that we claimed to exist over here. Okay, so I've done a couple of other videos on linear algebra on the channel. Some of the ones that I'm most fond of are the ones where I do calculus type problems using linear algebra. So one of those should be on the screen right now if you want to check it out. And that's a good place to stop.